The following is a lecture given by His Holiness Jaya Swami on May 28, 1984 in New Orleans, Louisiana. The class begins with a reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, Chapter 8, Verse 6 through 7. My Lord, you are the best of the Brahmanas, especially because you are fully aware of the Jyoti Shastra, the astrological science. Therefore, you are naturally the spiritual master of every human being. This being so, since you have kindly come to my house, kindly execute the reformatory activities for my two sons. Translation with repetition. My Lord, My Lord, you are the best of the Brahmanas. You are the best of the Brahmanas. Especially because you are fully aware. Especially because you are fully aware. Of the Jyoti Shastra, the astrological science. Of the Jyoti Shastra, the astrological science. Therefore you are naturally the spiritual master. Therefore you are naturally the spiritual master. Of every human being. Of every human being. This being so, this is being so, since you have kindly come to my house, since you have kindly come to my house, kindly execute, kindly execute the reformatory activities, the reformatory activities for my two sons, for my two sons. Purport, Shri Prabhupada, the supreme personality of Godhead Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 4:13. The four varnas, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Sudra, must be present in society. The Brahmanas are required for the guidance of the whole society. If there is no such institution as Varnashram Dharma, and if human society has no such guide as the Brahmana, human society will be hellish. In Kali Yuga, especially at the present moment, there is no such thing as a real Brahmana. Therefore, society is in a chaotic condition. Formerly, there were qualified Brahmanas, but at present, although there are certainly persons who think themselves as Brahmanas, they actually have no ability to guide society. The Krishna consciousness movement is therefore very much eager to reintroduce the Varnashram society into human society so that those who are bewildered or less intelligent will be able to take guidance from qualified Brahmanas. Brahmana means Vaishnava. After one becomes a Brahmana, the next stage of development in human society is to become a Vaishnava. People, in general, must be guided to the destination or goal of life. And therefore they must understand Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The whole system of Vedic knowledge is based on this principle. But people have lost the clue. Nate vidu hi Vishnu. And they are simply pursuing sense gratification with the risk of gliding down to a lower grade of life. Mitu Sangsara Vartmani. It doesn't matter whether one is born a Brahmana or not. No one is born a Brahmana. Everyone is born a sudra, but by the guidance of a brahmana and by samskara, one can become dvija, twice born, and then gradually become a brahmana. Brahmanism is not a system meant to create a monopoly for a particular class of men. Everyone should be educated so as to become a brahmana. At least there must be an opportunity to allow everyone to attain the destination of life. 
regardless of whether one is born in a Brahmana family, a Kshatriya family, or a Sudra family. One may be guided by a proper Brahmana and be promoted to the highest platform of being a Vaishnava. Thus the Krishna Consciousness Movement affords an opportunity to develop the right destiny for human society. Nanda Maharaj took advantage of the opportunity of Gargamuni's presence by requesting him to perform the necessary reformatory activities for his sons to guide them toward the destination of life. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 8, Text 7. The chapter entitled, Lord Krishna Shows the Universal Form. So, today, in society, there is a emergency situation. So the bottom line for a civilization to be considered civilized is that they should at least follow Varnashram system. And of course, the perfection of civilization is when they're actually God conscious completely. Well, for both of these purposes, Brahmanas are essential. A Brahmana is both someone who practices very pure, sattvic living standard and who is always engaged in instructing others. In this way, the Brahmanas. They're moving independent from the other material activities of the society simply for the welfare of the people at large. Actually, yesterday on the radio show, somebody asked a question, something about you're dependent upon society. If it wasn't for the hardworking people, where would you be or something like that? I never got a chance to answer that. The MC commentator he ended the show at that, at that time but actually the Brahmana they have a right to not work they have a right to uh, beg or to get their income from the people directly because they are fulfilling a service to the society in general they are providing spiritual education. They are providing opportunity for people to become God conscious. Of course, Srila Prabhupada never liked the idea of simply asking for something and giving nothing in return. Therefore, he always wanted us, he preferred, if when we ask for something, or we, if we can give something back, which would be beneficial. To that person. And this way people would not uh, consider that uh, they're not getting anything from what they're giving, or at least the society in general would get back more than whatever they gave, because they're giving something material, and they're getting back something which is priceless, which is beyond value calculation is something which is spiritual, which is eternal. So Prabhupada, he started this program of book distribution. In India especially, people have taken advantage by begging. They don't give anything. They just take. You know, it's not unusual to find a man and his wife wearing saffron in mm. Bengal, chanting door to door and begging for money. First of all, nobody should wear saffron unless they are in the renounced uh, three orders of life, uh, three austere orders or whatever we're calling, if everyone's austere, but brahmachari, vanaprastha, and sannyas. So, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he, he made a little jingle which described this. Golai mala nakir tilak. Piche ase sundar bala sab khuli chela. Little tilak on his nose and uh, beads on his neck, tilak on his nose. He's walking along, but behind him his wife goes. <laughs> Little his girlfriend goes. So it's actually sundar bala. 
<clears throat> these all followers of Kali Yuga. That Lord Chaitanya, he never discouraged anyone from being a Grihastha, from being a Brahmana, from being whatever they were and presenting themselves as that. But he was definitely against someone presenting himself to be something that he was not. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur began this tradition that uh, where he, he didn't want to he wanted to uh, show something. He didn't want to be misunderstood. So Prabhupada he put that into practice by encouraging us to give out uh, transcendental literature, prashanam, to be visibly uh, providing the services for the people. He said that the Krishna conscious devotee should be known as the most upright, honest people in society as providing the spiritual service for society. That was his actual intention. That's what he wanted. Because how can a preacher preach if the people uh, don't have respect or faith in him? Gargamuni Muni came. He was immediately accepted by Nanda Maharaj. He was renowned. He was a uh, uh, expert in Brahminical sciences. Therefore, whatever he said, they would accept it as something very authoritative and they would try to live by his instruction. This type of a faith is necessary for a preacher to have a good effect. How can you preach to someone uh, and have full effectiveness if the person in every thought, every word is thinking whether this person is a cheater or not, whether this person is trying to rip me off or not. One has to establish a relationship of faith where the person is able to put confidence in the person who is preaching to him. That is ideal. That is actually where we want to go to. So, Srila Prabhupada said the solution is that people should read our books. And of course we should have a, a good standard of behavior. Another point here, of course, when the Brahmanas often they would know the uh, astrological science. So when they came, people would ask them naturally, what's my future? What's, uh, what's the situation hold for me? Then, well, by astrological calculations, they could give them some advice. You're this kind of person, and this is your situation. And that would also <coughs> help that person. Then naturally they would give advice on how to make their life more Krishna conscious more God conscious at the same time. But it was a good avenue to attract the people. People nationally were very interested. They were interested to know about their future. So <clears throat> immediately gave something to discuss it. Once you're talking about a person, then they start to open up and then they would also tell them how to apply this into their life. Because the Brahmana was actually a well-wisher, because he didn't have a high overhead by nature, Brahmana was very simple, was very uh, <clears throat> truthful, austere, religious, clean. So the Brahmana was uh, it's not, uh, it's not a big burden on society at all because he lived very simply. Even when Chanaka Pandit was offered to be the prime minister of the entire empire of northern India, about was it Chandra Gupta was two, three thousand years ago. <clears throat> At that time, uh, he refused to live in the palace. He was provided as a prime minister, he could have a big palace. He refused it. He said, no, as a Brahmin, I don't want to live in your palace or any other palace. I want to live in a grass hut. So outside of the palace compound, he constructed a grass hut and he lived there. And he wouldn't take any salary. He said, I want to be a paid man. I'm working voluntarily. If I get any donation, I may accept it. This was the nature of Brahminical culture. Not to be dependent. As soon as you're dependent upon someone, just like the politicians, they're trying to satisfy the people. Even the Kshatri wasn't supposed to be dependent. He was supposed to... It's not a popular thing. He's supposed to follow the advice of the scriptures and the Brahmanas. Naturally, the people would be satisfied because society would be well organized and people would have enough food.
food, shelter, clothing, and spiritual uh, facility. And so when the Brahminical culture broke down and Brahmanas started to consider themselves an elite caste and they started to envy the other, then <clears throat> from there <clears throat> the Kshatriyas became more selfish and greedy without proper guidance from Brahminical culture. In this way the whole uh, Vedic culture basically uh, fell apart. It didn't completely fall apart, but it started to disintegrate to the extent that all of the, the no emperor could, was uh, powerful enough to uh, maintain the, the entire uh, India as one empire. There was many small kings and several uh, two or three uh, emperors. And so the uh, Mughals or the Persians and Arabian hordes, they were able to run over Western India first and they were able to conquer large parts of Northern India initially. Although South India was able to keep them out for a long time, finally about four or five, about 400 years ago they made inroads into South India. And then the British came, but South India and uh, Orissa Orissa, practically, except for parts of northern Orissa, most of Orissa was never under Mohammedan rule, was never under British rule until uh, later. Similarly, uh, sometimes people criticize, well, Maharaj Pratap Arudra was a Vaishnav. This is, uh, somehow this weakens a monarch or weakens a, a, a person. But uh, Pratap Arudra was more effective in keeping out the Mohammedans from Arisa, the uh, Mughal uh, the Badshahs were trying to attack him. Then, practically speaking, uh, he was uh, he was never conquered. He may not have been an aggressor. He didn't go out and conquer vast areas of new land uh, at that period of time. But uh, he didn't give up any land. He was very effective. And similarly, Arisa was and. The other <coughs> Vaishnav uh, king who built Tirupati temple, who was in South India, uh, Krishna Devarai, he was also the time of Lord Chaitanya. His was, uh, there, were, there were travelers from uh, Portugal and Italy who have independently recorded visiting his kingdom. And uh, the descriptions they gave uh, were, were incredible. Fantastic! How opulent it was! All the sub kings would give one third of their taxes to the emperor. That was a system, and they would give a fixed number of soldiers and military things every year. And the emperor, therefore, he had a bigger army, and he was his army was if the small if the kings had their own army, but if they couldn't handle any crises, the emperor would come and support. This was a system. So his kingdom, Devarai, Krishna Devarai kingdom went. The whole total South India, under Pradesh, uh, his capital was in Humphrey, right down to the tip, right up to Godavari, right up to Ramananda Rai. And from Ramananda Rai up was uh, Pratakarutra. So, during the time of Lord Chaitanya, these Vaishnava uh, kings, they were able to protect themselves uh, very effectively. And they had... Uh, so that's not a valid criticism. It's when people become corrupt, when they become overly materialistic, or if they become impersonalistic, that's when they become, uh, they want to give everything up and they want to uh, fade away to the Brahman. So that's when they start to become uh, less useful for fulfilling their duty. So the actual need, of course, is people to be assigned their responsibility. What is the whole Varnashram system? Is that according to a person's work, he should act in a particular way. There's already people who are teachers, administrators, businessmen, and laborers. But the Varnashram system gives with each category certain inherent responsibilities. For instance, a teacher is also supposed to have an impeccable character. Recently in the newspaper, it gave how one 
uh, high school uh, teacher, I forget where it was, how he was accused of having relationships with his students of both sexes. And, and uh, there, there was a whole, there was some special somewhere, a child uh, abuse. And many of the school teachers, they have uh, abused their position in this way. This is, a, this is the whole problem. You have a school teacher, he's one of the natural leaders of society. He says the king, the parent, the school teacher, the, the, the politician, the parents, and the school teacher, these are natural leaders of society because school teachers, they're going to train the children. They're going to create the future citizens of a country. So teachers, teaching is one of the duties of a brahmana. So he is supposed to have an impeccable character. He's supposed to be almost like a uh, spiritual master in one sense. He is a spiritual man. He's, at least he's their uh, their master in terms of uh, teaching master, and he should be spiritually and materially impeccable in his character. Similarly, a politician he also is supposed to have certain rules, a country is supposed to act in a certain way. This is very scientifically made so that they know what is their duty to society so that they act in such a way that they actually fulfill their duties. If someone is an administrator, he's supposed to be fearless. He's supposed to be courageous. He's supposed to be able to go out just like if we just like in Mayapur we were attacked. Here were the policemen. We brought them. We said kindly that the, the one devotee lived outside at a house. He's a grihas who lived down about a half a mile. When he saw that we were attacked, he went to get the police. He said, uh, kindly, I'll take him my bicycle. We won't go by bicycle. They walked. When they got near the temple, the, the battle was still going on. They all had rifles. He said, all right, you should go. They said, wait, let it cool down. We don't want to risk our lives. They're not country, they're suitors. A country, they're not run away from a battle. They're not considering. They're not cowards. So this is a problem. You have policemen or you have uh, politicians who take position, but they should have the quality of being ready to then sacrifice their life for the cause of the nation, for the cause of uh, fulfilling their duty. If their only purpose is to fatten their pockets, then what is it here? So this type of system that if a person has a particular occupation of duty, he should also have certain qualities and he should act with certain responsibilities. Otherwise, even though he's doing that occupation, he won't be perfected and the society will be disorderly. And that's exactly what's happening today. Even we have these categories of people because the teachers don't have a high character because the, the uh, political leaders don't have that type of courage in many cases or that type of integrity. Even they're allowed to take remuneration for what they do, but then they should also protect the citizens who are helpless without the administration taking the active role as the protector. Similarly, the businessmen, they have a duty to provide economic strength for the entire society. They're considered the stomach. If the vice of the businessmen uh, are able to create a very strong economic base, then their society is very strong. But if the, uh, they create the chambers of commerce and then think how to manipulate the market so the prices go up artificially and the people are therefore uh, they may become wealthy, but in fact the people become artificially weakened. It's not a proper balance. Better they're to work on a certain uh, system. But that can only happen if the administration and the brahmanas are strong. So in this way the checks and balances are there if everybody fulfills. And that depends on strong spiritual guides. So actually this Krishna conscious movement is creating is that they are especially to train up brahmanas. We are having the shaved hair and the sikhas and them because this is the natural insignia of brahmana. 
Yesterday after the program, one uh, Indian was there, he's a Banerjee, Banerjee is Banopadaya, one of the more aristocratic Brahminical families of India. He said, you are, uh, you are all the real Brahmanas. We are a name Brahmana, but we are not able to do much. But you are actually the Brahmanas. And this you'll hear in many places. Of course, there are some very bigoted kind of caste Brahmanas who don't want to accept anyone who's not a born Brahmana. But in general, the modern Brahmanas of the day, they kind of see that what Krishna consciousness is doing. They don't have to put the words in their mouth. They will spontaneously say, you are practicing Brahminical culture. Because if Vaishnava is spontaneously, automatically a Brahmana, the next stage from Brahmana is Vaishnava. So what our temples are, are factories for producing and training Brahmana. What is a Brahmana? Brahmana means that he is thinking, especially a Vaishnava, is someone who is Boradukha Dukhi, is considering how to help this misled society, how to help the people who are suffering in illusion to regain their natural position as devotees of Krishna. Even other people, they may remain in their position as businessmen or laborers, but the brahmanas, they're there to train them up how to lead their life, just like Gargi Muni, but he's going to tell Landa Maharaj so many things. Of course, Landa Maharaj is already trained up, but today people are completely in illusion. So that's why we have a high standard which we have to maintain in our time. We are Brahmanas. The Prabhupada said, I've done half the work. The next half is Varnashram. That means to train up the rest of society to act in their particular occupational duties in devotional service. Contributing service to Krishna according to their capabilities. And of course, we have to go on recruiting more people to be Brahmana. Sometimes you hear someone say, I worked for the Krishna conscious movement for seven years, what have I got? That person is not a Brahmana at all. A Brahmana is not trying to get anything. He's trying to serve. That is why a Brahmana can take a donation and it doesn't have any karma because the Brahmana won't keep it for himself. Immediately he gives it to the Krishna and then uses it for uplifting others. He uses it to build a temple for people's spiritual youth, for uh, purchasing books, to purchase books, to give books to people who are interested in reading the books, for other type, for distributing prasadam, uh, for building a Krishna conscious uh, farm, to uh, protect the cows and to provide a shelter for people to come who are not able to live in the city or not ideally suited for living in the city but who can practice God consciousness in uh, that type of a natural situation. So that is what we want. We want the favor of Krishna. We want People there are social workers. I was, uh, the first time I went to Thailand with uh, Rupa Nuga Prabhu and Balabanta, they went there, they wanted to start a program for Sir, the distributing prasadam to the Cambodian refugees. So when we went there, we found that they were already were late. They thought they had like, they were months late. There were literally 50 volunteer organizations there of every country, name, shape, Oxfam, Refam, whatever, uh, SIDA, UNICEF, Caritas, CARE, just flooded. They begged and they approached us. The people who were the welfare workers said, please have prashad distribution for us. We can't stand this place. We're completely bored. The food here stinks. We want, if you open up a prashadam restaurant, we'll be very happy. They're, they all go there, they're there for three, four months. They get bored stiff after the first week. And they're just waiting to go back home. When they go back then, they're heroes. 
serve the camp. But you know, when they're there, they're people are miserable. I mean, you can see that here the devotees, when they're distributing prasadam, doing arathyatra, distributing books, when they're doing preaching, they're blissful. They're ecstatic because they're doing it, knowing it, uh, and, and directly is pleasing to Krishna. And they have that developed, that Brahminical culture where they actually have compassion to help others. Here they have a sentiment, when they actually get there and they see the sick people, and they, they do it, but it's, they're just unhappy. The whole night they just they want to have their parties, and it's just like it's some kind of a, it's very strange combination. They have a touch of goodness in them, but because of their not being trained out in Brahminical culture, it's, uh, it's very unnatural for them to maintain that kind of an attitude for more than a couple of weeks. They have to mix it with a lot of sense gratification, and there's no sense gratification on the Cambodian border. <laughs> and therefore they, they want to go back to uh, Bangkok or something. It's just it's an unusual situation. They want to go back to where they came from pretty fast. So this is what, what is, is actually needed. A person cannot be an effective uh, creature without developing this Brahminical standard. Therefore, immediately we have to follow four regular principles, chant Hare Krishna every day, study the literatures, know what we are giving the people, and be actively engaged in giving out the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. That is the actual pure Brahmana Vaishnava activity. When somebody falls down from the Brahmanical stand, then they can think, what am I doing this for? And if somebody is in the Brahmanical attitude, if they're actually understanding what is the purpose of life, and they want to help others to achieve that purpose of life, then they don't have to look anywhere else for their satisfaction. That itself is the most fulfilling thing. Especially when one is awakened to pure devotional service, and one is understanding this is the desire of Lord Chaitanya. This is actually what he wants. Then one can experience the highest ecstasies of Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada explained, we're not to imitate Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya, he sat around and talked about Krishna, Leela, with his intimate associates. He was enjoying those pastimes of Krishna relishing them. But he is Krishna. That's his position. But we are the servants of the servants of the servants of Krishna. Our position is to serve the Lord's idea. We're the servants of the servants of the servants of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya wanted that the fallen people would be given the opportunity to taste that nectar of life to become God conscious. So all of the associates, after Lord Chaitanya left, they were all actively engaged in different types of activities, writing literatures or distributing literatures. Nartam uh, Das Thakur, he wrote a poem, four-liner, where, I can't remember the Bengali right now, or the Sanskrit, but uh, he basically said, that Lord Chaitanya has varieties of energies. Some of those energies are engaged in writing transcendental literatures. And other energies are engaged in distributing them. Like Srinivasacharya. And he mentioned writing like Rupa and Sanatana. So, the six Goswamis, they wrote transcendental literatures, which even to this day, and which for the next thousand millenniums, they are going to be the standard of pure devotional service. And similarly, Srinivasacharya, Shamananda Pandit, other, they took those literatures and they distributed them, they preached on them, they established their authority that Chaitanya Charita, Mrita, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, this is the proper understanding of the purpose of the Bhagavatam. This is where the Bhagavatam is leading one. This is the method how to practice in this Kali Yuga, Krishna consciousness. So, but everyone is a team. Everyone living in the temple is a part of this Brahminical team to disseminate Krishna consciousness to the society at large. 
And when the people are going out distributing books and someone else is uh, cooking for them, it's not that that person is not engaged in the preaching activity, he's part of the team. And actually that attitude should be adopted by everyone. This is our purpose, is for giving out Krishna consciousness to society at large. If they're having difficulty in assuming that, then sometime maybe they should go on Harinam or go on some activity just to see how the people in the world are needing this Krishna consciousness and to get in that attitude. But everyone should feel a part of that preaching mission. There's a special idea of having these uh, temples and having the communities is for disseminating Krishna consciousness to the people at large. So, no one should ever doubt what is the purpose. That the purpose of the activities is for disseminating. That is our actual gain. That is what we want to uh, take as our pay. Because Srila Prabhupada he said, if we give Krishna consciousness, and if our purpose is to please Krishna, then that means we go to Krishna. But if we have some other purpose, then Krishna may give us that, He may fulfill that particular desire, but then we don't get Krishna. Somebody wants some material thing in exchange for this devotional service, is foolish. In one sense. Of course you can get it, Krishna will give. One should still do devotional service, no doubt. It said, Akamo Sarva Kamo Vamoksha Kamo Dharadi Te Brena Bhakti Joga Inajade Te Purushan Param. But it's like Robert made the example if you go to a multi millionaire and you're sitting in his office, he says, I can, all right, what do you want? And if you ask him, give me some ashes from your ashtray, what is the use of it? You can get that anywhere. If you're going to go to the trouble of approaching someone big, at least then you can ask something significant. Like in India, the big multi-millionaires, they are not approached to donate a bag of rice. They're cultivated and they're approached to give some significant contribution for building a temple or for doing something. One uh, Mr. Birla came to visit our temple. At the same time, the secretary of the Communist Party of India was there. And one of the biggest newspaper reporters also showed up. So he saw that the biggest industrialist is here. Down the hall is the biggest communist. And they're both staying in the same Hare Krishna guest house in Mayapur. So then he asked the communist, well, what are you doing here? Here the capitalists are here. They said, no, this is a place for everyone. It's a place of the people. It's all right. <laughs> then he went to the capitalist and said, what are you doing here? And he said, no, it's the place of God. Very nice atmosphere we come here to. So then, when the, Mr. Birla got back home, he said, I think you know that I liked your temple very much, like the activities. Here's a, a small token of my appreciation, a 25,000 rupee donation. Uh, nothing for him. <laughs> he knew, he, he knew we're going to be visiting him anyway, so. <laughs> uh, but that kind of a mail-in donation, it shows a sincere appreciation and that's the kind of thing that, uh, that's what a Vaishya should do. But this is the type of cultivation the people in general, they can appreciate or hear something which is being done. So the point was that if we have any desire for material, then we take it like the, oh yeah, that was the point, the rich, we ask him for ashes, what's to use? A person like that, even without asking, he can give you 25,000. Even without asking, but to speak, if you ask him, there are people who have, can contribute uh, in dollars, no. easily they can contribute uh, 5, 10, 20, 30,000 dollars at a time, but it takes years of cultivation sometimes, before they have that amount of faith. It's not that the first time they come, we sign them up and then they'll give you five dollars. Sure. But in any case, if you're going to ask him for something, what, what's the use of asking him for something insignificant? If you're going to ask for something, then ask for something which is suitable to their uh, 
capacity. So when you're serving Krishna, why ask him for something material? Which you can get anywhere. You can even get it just, you know, with a little material karma, what to speak of. Get from Krishna what he really has to offer. That is his eternal devotional service. That is the actual gain. That's what it means to be a Brahmana Vaishnava, is to understand what is the actual goal of life. Aham Brahmasmi is Brahmana. I am not this body, I am spirit soul. I am a part of Brahman. And a Vaishnava means Jivara Sarupoi Nipto Krishna Das. I am the eternal servant of Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Ram, Ram, Ram. One question. Generally, the people in India, are they fooled by these charlatan uh, sannyasas and renunciates? The cheaters and the cheaters. But they threw out Rajneesh. He wasn't offering them anything but something they didn't want. They have some morality in India. It was just immoral. <laughs> I mean, at least, you know, the normal sadhus offer, well, if you touch my feet or worship, or they give some, then uh, you can have a big family, or you can have a lot of material facility, you can do whatever, you know, or do whatever you want type of thing. But then Rajneesh was actively promoting, it's not immoral activities, it's just, it's too much. Orgies and stuff, in the name of some kind of this. Yeah, how is it that Arisa would have a strong, you know, um, history of Vaishnava kings, um, and, and, and that Mazen had been conquered, not so poor, and uh, Gujarat was conquered, and Mazen um, was so rich? Because the Orisans gave the biggest, the hardest time to the English to take over. They were like the last to go. And even after the British took over, the Orisans. They just don't like to do control. I don't know who tied this knot here, but he could undo it because it's not convenient for playing. So the British purposely didn't develop a reason. They kept the people really down. There's no industry there. Zero industry. There's they just didn't they just but they developed big cotton mills and everything. They developed uh, Gujarat, tobacco, cotton. So because of that. Plus the, the Orisans are good Brahmanas and Kshatriyas. I don't know, you know, how developed their Vaishyas are. But the, uh, the Rajasthani uh, and the uh, Gujaratis, Vaishyas are very, they're very developed. Bengal and Orisa Brahmanas are famous all over India. But um, their Vaishyas are not like super famous. I mean, they have, of all of them, the Subarna Bonics are the most together Vaishyas of Bengal. And they got Sahus, but I mean, they're all right. I mean, but they're not proven to be as effective uh, a Vaishya as uh, the uh, Marwari Vaishyas, Agarwala, as, or as these, uh, I don't know, yeah, the, these uh, Gujaratis, pretty, pretty industrious people. I mean, they, they, they've gone all over the world and, and they're very effective. <coughs> Cities have shown some pretty good acumen on a, a different on one level. So right now the world is economic competition. But they were so they were kept back by the British. Everyone knows that. The, the British were... The bad was the British is thing. If you cooperate with us, we'll, we'll cooperate with you. And the, the Orisans didn't cooperate, so... The Bengalis did, so they had to be careful in Calcutta. His, his point was that the Mongols, how did they penetrate through the rat? They so religious in Vaishnava. That wasn't his question. They said that the Chatrias, when they died in battle, they were going to have them. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, some Chatrias were in battle, like say, the battle for the Kaker. Some were on the right side of the army, some were on the other side of the other army. So, most of the many battles, the judges were involved, some were fighting with the his army, and some were against, fighting against it. They were fought either against the enemy principles of the army, and all the judges were against the enemy principles of the army.
is that these countries, you know, everybody thinks they're right. <laughs> so when they can, everyone told them they weren't right, but they were considering that they were right, and they had reasons <laughs> which which weren't right. But uh, so then the only way it could be decided was by going to war, but they were going and fighting according to the principles of the Vedas. So that's different than a thief robbing in the night and then you kill the thief and he's fighting with you and he dies. That's not Kshatriya. But following this religious principle, you have a dispute, you think you're right, they think you're right, they think they're right, and then so who's to say exactly who's right? Ultimately, the brahmanas, they give their opinion, but, uh, you know, it gets political. So, in some cases, uh, they, uh, if they're following that, my understanding is that if they're following the Vedic system and they're fighting according to the Vedic uh, rules, and if they die in that type of, or you know, they die in a, in a, in a, in a battle, like that, that was considered uh, enough. They run away and they get shot in the back or something. They're not going to, as if they die, face forward in the battle. People ask that sometimes because of uh, bad stuff that happens to them. They Well, they're not going to get liberation. I mean, they're certainly in material consciousness, but that's a type of piety. I mean, that kind of an integrity that the demigods can appreciate to some extent. Of course, uh, there are mleshes, javanas, calculus. So, I mean, this is especially applied for countries. But whether it applies for everyone in a battle, whether it applies for Javanas in a battle, or Meshes in a battle. Well, that's, uh, in the 12th chapter. Does it mention that anywhere? Yeah, it mentions that one can't even do, you know, uh, if, he's thinking, if he has a concept like that his country is God and he works in that direction, then Krishna will accept. Is this, you know, Krishna says, if you can't surrender to me, then work for me. And in, in the purpose there, about 12, 7. Prabhupada describes that even that social work with the selfless dedication that will gradually advance one when it comes to know what is The point is that the, cut, the country is, sees that he's doing his duty for to God, that this is his duty. This duty is a law which is handed down by God, so that even in their dying like that, although it definitely has some material motivation, but there's also a connection with, with Krishna. So, definitely they're going to get more glorious uh, uh, by dying in the battle for their, for their, uh, for God and their country. They're going to get a better reaction. The, because the point is that even if they commit so many sinful activities, that itself is purifying. I mean, they've given their life, just like a man gets hung then he's, he gets to go to Swarga, to heavenly planet, after getting hung, even he's a murderer, because he's considered absolved. He gets, he gets his karmas wiped out for that. I don't know how high up he goes, but I mean, he gets absolved from that karma. So similarly, if a person uh, is dying in a battle like that, so that, that's uh, purifying. I know that uh, Krishna, he didn't want to fight with the Javanas. Kala Javana he didn't want to fight with them. The more that they are God conscious, uh, they'll get a, a benefit. And it's the best way for someone like that to go. Uh, I heard the, the radio show was very, very nice. <clears throat> My lowly opinion, it sounded like um, you were going in like a needle and coming out like a house. Because in the beginning, it sounded very timid, you know, this is so Swami from India. Um, my poor, and then as it went along, the points became became bigger, and it seemed to be very effective. Like that. But also, I noticed that the commentary, Joe Collada, whatever his name is, uh, you can see the importance of, 
like you're speaking of what are we getting Prabhupada's books to the importance because he uh, presented himself as having studied some Oriental philosophy, some Indian philosophy, but every word out of his mouth was impersonalism. And without Prabhupada's books, that's what is happening in everybody. Prabhupada's books are the authors. I read so many books before I came here. All in person, every one. He was talking Zen Buddhism or something. Yeah. Giving up your ego, <clears throat> your the nothingness or something. It seemed too, too big a subject to really. I mean, I don't know how much time I have. Lalit Latika Bhakti? Lalit Latika Bhakti? Prabhupada told one devotee that uh, whose father owned a factory that he should make his factory Krishna conscious, have tapes playing, programs. So uh, the point is, uh, the uh, especially the brahmanas would be following all of the principles, and we would try to get everyone to follow all the principles, at least as many as possible. And uh, yes, people would take up the uh, different occupations. Definitely there would be an army, but uh, this way it's essential that we have a qualified uh, brahmanas, people who know the philosophy, who can uh, dissolve the people's doubts. Of course, if the whole world becomes Krishna conscious, then uh, you still need an army just to keep out the thieves and rogues, but uh, there's always there's always going to be some rogues, there's always going to be some antisocial elements, so you're going to need a police force and an army in this world. Even in the Swarga, they have their own army. Even in the planets, they have an army, so what to speak of here? But uh, obviously, it wouldn't be, it would... Uh, be less, uh, it wouldn't be overdone to the extent it is today if there's no conflict. It was the one when I was leaving the radio show where the person after me was a school teacher, Glenn something. He said, well, if everybody had one idea, and he said, well, if people were like this, Joe Collado said, if people were like this, then there'd be no wars in their world. He said, well, if anybody had one idea, there'd be no wars. That was just intellectual adjustment. That was the thing is that uh, there's some places you can get islands. You can make it your own country. But then if you do that, then uh, then the danger is, you see, then uh, if you're your own country, then who protects you? There's pirates. In those places, there's pirates. And they'll just come and rob you. And they have the arms and cannons and bazookas and all kinds of stuff. So if you're your own country, that means that there's, you know, then you got to have your army, you got to have your defense, you have to have everything. So that's why a lot of these small countries are like called protectorates. They're under, you know, bigger like Britain or England or America or something. Bhutan has got a defense agreement with India. So if you have a, if you have a country, you got to have an army, at least to defend yourself from that. If you don't, then you just like open pray that people come and take it. Yes. Can the devotees preach in our space? Some people are there, we've heard. Some of the devotees are there. <laughs> <laughs> I heard someone said some devotee was spaced out. <laughs> Let's do first things first. We're worrying about outer space. We haven't even got the inner space yet. <laughs> there, if, you, uh, if person really wants to, you know, if preaching a civilized society is too difficult, well then there's also, there's a lot of tribal people in the world. That's where the Christians go. <laughs> in India, <laughs> different places. The Pope just visited New Guinea and they made a big uh, inroads preaching to the Aborigines and headhunters there. 
I made them all Christian there, carried a big cross, it was a big thing. It's fairly easy to preach to those people. Of course, maybe Christianity is easier because they just get them to stop eating human flesh, but they can eat everything else. <laughs> you want to get them to be vegetarian. But I mean, there's other, you know, not so far gone uh, tribals. And they're very simple people, you can preach to them. And many people think that they're in outer space. In the future, we'll go to other planets, no doubt. I don't know about the space in between them. The, uh, there are, of course, uh, different levels in between where like uh, yakshas and uh, others live. So we could go and preach there also. But normally to do that, you have to uh, have a body which is suitable for those environments. So since right now Krishna has given us a body here, which is suitable for this environment, and this body only lasts 60, 70 years, 80 years anyway. So we should uh, take the make the best use of this bargain and preach here, and then subsequently, in our next birth, uh, we'll have opportunity to, if we have a keen desire to preach in other places, we could take birth there and be able to preach there. Some uh, liberated souls, they report back to Krishna and then preach again other places. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.